everyone. Welcome back. Happy New Year. Charlie Bell here. Special show today, 2023, the year in charts. I'm going to run through the charts and themes that tell the story of 2023. Number one, the wall of worry. So there was a wall of worry in markets a mile high entering 2023, and for good reason. You had just come off of the worst year for the stock market, looking at the S&P 500, since 2008, down 18%. And you had the worst year for the bond market. If you look at the 10-year Treasury bond, down 17.8%, worst year in history. And it's very rare for stocks and bonds to be down together in a calendar year, but we've never seen them both down in excess of 10% in a given year with return data going back to 1928. So naturally, investors are afraid. They're thinking that these negative returns are going to continue. And their biggest fear, and the biggest fear that everyone was talking about was the fear of a downturn in the economy, the fear of recession. And I did this poll back in December of 2022, basically asking, is the economy already in a recession or will it be one in, in 2023? And most people said yes, that if we're not in a recession already, one is coming in 2023. Very few people said no, 85% said yes. And that wasn't the only concern. You had concerns about inflation, you have concerns about rising interest rates, falling earnings, the war in Ukraine, and of course the Fed and their ongoing tightening of monetary policy. So a huge wall of worry entering the year, and that could be shown in a number of ways looking at sentiment. Here's one looking at individual investors who are polled each week. The AAII poll here showed 40 consecutive weeks where bears in this poll outnumbered bulls, and that was the longest streak we've ever seen with data going back to 1987. So extreme negativity in terms of investor sentiment, in terms of consumer confidence, in 2022, we actually saw a record low in the University of Michigan Consumer Confidence Index, and it really didn't recover by year end. It had a record eight straight months below 60. That was worse than what we saw in 2008, worse than what we saw in 1980. So really the worst consumer sentiment, the unhappiest consumers we've ever seen in history entering 2023. And if we look at Wall Street strategists, this is a group that's almost always bullish. If you look at their forecast, it's just a question of how much higher they're saying the market's going to be. Well, that wasn't the case entering 2023. For the first time ever, they were actually predicting a down year for stocks. So naturally, we start 2023, and what happens? Well, the market starts to move in the other direction. There's something known as the pain trade, and that was precisely, I think, what was going on here. The pain trade is the concept that the market has a tendency to move in the direction that causes the most pain to the most participants. And in early 2023, given all of this negative sentiment, that pain trade was definitely up. And what we saw by February 2nd of 2023 was actually one of the best starts to a year in history, the fifth best start that we've seen, best start since 1987. But it wouldn't be smooth sailing the entire year. There are definitely dips along the way. And the, really the first test that the market received would be earnings. And if earnings that we started receiving were not very good, these were Q4 earnings, we actually saw another decline for S&P 500 earnings overall, 27% year over year. You had a lot of tech companies contributing to that. And this was again, 2022 data that came out in 2023. But this kind of brought the market back down to reality. A lot of the initial concerns came back after these earnings reports and market participants were saying, well, gosh, if this continues, it maybe it's going to be another bad year for stocks. But it's often not something that people are anticipating that will drive the market down a lot. It's often something that's a big surprise. So earnings going down was definitely expected coming into the year. What was not expected was what happened next, which was a run on the bank. So fast forward from February to March and what you had over the course of a few days was among the two biggest failures in history, Silicon Valley Bank, and Signature Bank. And bank failures wasn't something that we heard about in recent years. We didn't really hear about it at all 
because there really weren't any bank failures of note in 2021 and 2022. There are exactly zero bank failures in the U.S. And if we look at the five years prior to that, only really small, no name banks were failing. So this was a big shift in a very short period of time and something that really no one was predicting coming into 2023. What went wrong? What happened with Silicon Valley Bank? Well, they had assets on their balance sheet that had gone down in value. These were mortgage-backed securities, treasury securities, longer duration, so they didn't manage their interest rate risks. And when interest rates rose, the value of these securities fell. They decided to sell some of these securities at a loss. That spooked investors, and then it spooked depositors. And like wildfire, really, the panic spread. And over the course of a few days, massive amounts of money was being pulled from this bank. And in a single day on March 9th, $42 billion in attempted withdrawals uh, on that single day. The very next day, the regulators stepped in and said, we have to shut this thing down. And so this was on a Friday. They shut it down. And you had a lot of panic between that point and Sunday night uh, when the Fed, the Treasury, and the FDIC came in to save the day to say, depositors are going to be made whole. doesn't matter if these are uninsured deposits above the FDIC insurance limit. We're going to bail them out and things are going to be okay. And we're going to do the same with signature banks. So that calmed people in the short run. What they also did more importantly in terms of the Fed was try to prevent uh, future banks from having a similar situation. They came up with this thing called the bank term funding program, which is essentially providing liquidity to these banks, even if their security that they're posting as collateral had gone down in value. So let's say these are uh, mortgages or treasuries that are trading at 80 or 90 cents on the dollar. Well, they can get par value for that and they can meet uh, redemptions, meet those deposit outflows. Uh, without having to sell the security. So what the Fed did essentially was bring back the Fed put. Markets were pretty happy about that. They opened the discount uh, window, provided this massive amount of liquidity, and the S&P 500 would actually bottom for the year that very next day. So the Monday after that Sunday release, the S&P 500 hits its low point for the year, really never looks back. In early May, there was one other big failure. First Republic was actually the second biggest uh, bank failure by assets in history. But the interesting thing is that the market, the broader market, if you look at the S&P 500, barely budged. So by that point, people were pretty confident this isn't, isn't going to be a broader crisis. And it's kind of remarkable that the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in history, which happened in a short period of time in 2023, really ended up just being a footnote in terms of the year in a whole and the way investors look back on it. And that's because of what happened after that, which is essentially the market had a rising tide that lifted all boats. And that really erased the memories, the painful memories that investors had in this short period of time where these banks were failing. So very much unlike 2008, of course, where we had a financial crisis and all these banks failing, people thought, well, it happened before, so if we have banks failing again, it has to be another financial crisis. And this proved, of course, that that doesn't have to be the case. Every single time in markets is different. And um, if we look at this chart here, I think this is one to put on your wall as just kind of a reminder of that. We had total assets of $548 billion in failures between those three banks. There was two other very small ones that had almost no assets that failed as well. But that exceeded the total bank failure assets in 2008 by a huge margin. And yet the S&P 500 up well over 20% for the year, as we'll talk about later. So every single time is different and you can't predict in advance, even if you knew that this was going to happen, you probably would have guessed that the market would be down for the year or certainly not a great year. And of course, that's not what happened at all. So let's move on. And talk about the Fed. This was a very different kind of Fed, an unusual Fed. So the Fed put, that was kind of expected in terms of the Fed is going to do something. 
to try to help uh, prevent this from becoming a broader crisis, the banking issue. But was what was unexpected was that the Fed, at the same time it was doing that, would continue tightening its monetary policy. And why that was unexpected was if we look at previous times when you had huge declines in bank stocks. So if we think about March 2020 or October 2008, those are really the other two comparable periods here. Similar declines for this uh, regional bank ETF. What was the Fed doing in both of those time periods? They were aggressively cutting rates all the way to 0% in 2020 and 2008. In March 2023, when this banking crisis was going on, the Fed actually hiked interest rates. They continued with their plan of hiking interest rates, a very, very different response an unexpected response from the Fed, continued to hike interest rates. And then they did it again in May after the first Republic uh, failure. So Fed determined to bring inflation down regardless of what was going on in the markets, very different kind of response. And they really made inflation the number one priority for this year. So if we're looking at the Fed in total, they actually hiked interest rates another 100 basis points during 2023, which was above what people were expecting coming into the year. The market was kind of expecting maybe two hikes, they actually got four hikes. And that brought the Fed funds rate all the way up to 5.25 to 5.5% by the end of the year. So the last hike was in July. Then they held rates for the remainder of the year. But if we look at the two-year total here from 2022, 2023, the total increase here, 525 basis points, that was the largest for a two-year period that we've seen since 1979, 1980. So a long time since the Fed has been this aggressive in this short period of time. And if we look at the Fed funds rate and compare it to the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, what we see here is the tightest monetary policy that we've seen in the US since 2007. So we have a spread here of over 2% between that Fed funds rate where it stands now and that core inflation rate, the core PCE rate of 3.15%. So over 2%, we haven't seen that since, two, two, since 2007. And the big question for 2024 is going to be, well, do they keep it here? Do they keep this spread? Do they keep it tight? And no, the market is saying, no, they're not going to, but that is going to be the big question for 2024. Now, in terms of the balance sheet, another unexpected thing, again, during the bank crisis, very briefly, they provided that liquidity, the balance sheet expanded, but then they continued doing their quantitative tightening. And what we saw for the calendar year 2023 was actually the biggest decline in the Fed's balance sheet, $838 billion in terms of dollars and the biggest decline in terms of percent, 9.8% decrease in terms of the Fed balance sheet. So quantitative tightening, hiking interest rates, even though we had the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in history, what are people expecting from the Fed for 2024? Well, they're expecting the Fed to go back to being a more dovish, a more benevolent Fed. So here are the expectations as they stand today. All of this is likely to change and change significantly. These expectations are often wrong, but the market is saying the end of easy money is not, is not here. This is not the end of the Fed era uh, where they're going to keep monetary policy bias being easy. They're saying we're going to move back towards it in 2024, and the Fed is going to cut rates six times. And that will be the big question. Is the Fed going to show resolve if, if inflation becomes a problem or inflation doesn't come down as much as they want to? Are they going to leave rates higher for longer or are they going to bend to these market expectations and do what the market wants it to do, which is to bring interest rates back down? That'll be the big question for 2024. So every year has a big story and the big story for markets in 2023 was definitely AI, artificial intelligence. And this was a story that really captivated the hearts and minds of investors. Very few stories rise to the level where it starts to influence broader sentiment, but this is exactly what the AI story did and was probably one of the reasons why the market really was able to get through that banking period almost unscathed and kind of march higher after that first Republic failure. Uh, this exuberance over AI 
really started with chat GPT and it became in, I think February of 2023, the fastest app to hit a hundred million users in history. So faster than TikTok or Instagram or Pinterest or Spotify, two months it took for this app to hit a hundred million users. And everyone was talking about it at the time. It was pretty remarkable what it could do. Everyone was, was trying it out and saying, well, what are the implications going to be? Not just for this, this app, but for every single big tech company, are they going to be use this, using this to generate profits? And that's exactly what companies were talking about during their first quarter earnings. So if we look at mentions of AI in the first quarter of 2023, a huge spike for Google, Meta, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple versus 2022. And that would only continue throughout the year. It became all about AI. And of course, there's always a story stock in a given year. And very early on, it became clear that NVIDIA was going to be that story stock right out of the gate. NVIDIA took the lead in terms of best performing S&P 500 companies. And it held that lead pretty much the entire year with the enormous return, 239% return leading all S&P 500 companies. And if you look over here, that was uh, when NVIDIA reported its, its uh, first report showing that spike from AI. A NVIDIA being the leading chip maker for AI chips. I think they said at one point it had 90% plus of the market. I think it still maintains that. And just unbelievable growth, growth like we've never seen before for a company of its size. If you look at their revenues here, exploding higher, tripling off of the low from 2022, expecting to hit 20 billion in quarterly revenue when they report earnings next quarter. If we look at net income, the bottom line here, absolutely stunning, hugely, hugely profitable, 9 billion in net income. That's more than three times higher than the 2021 peak for uh, net income on a quarterly basis. And profit margins, they just because they had an explosion in sale doesn't mean that they gave up profit margins, they actually expanded profit margins to above 50% net profit margins. Just enormous number here. And so NVIDIA became the fifth company in the US to hit a uh, trillion dollar market cap here, joining Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and now you have NVIDIA above that trillion dollar mark. And if we look at the top performing S&P 500 companies in 2023, NVIDIA at the top of the list, actually have meta number two, and a big part of that was obviously their AI story as well, and a number of semiconductors participating along the way. So uh, AI, more than anything else, was a story about sentiment, about hope, about the prospects of the future, that this is going to help drive earnings higher for these big tech companies and for the S&P 500 as a whole. So that is a good segue into that Magnificent Seven. And the Magnificent Seven was something that came up time and time again. And the reason for that was that the outperformance of these seven companies versus the broader market was just unbelievable. It was really the exact opposite of what we saw in 2022. You have, of course, Nvidia leading the way, but Meta almost uh, tripling on the year. You have Tesla more than doubling. Amazon up 80%, Google close to 60, Microsoft close to 60, Apple close to 50, way ahead of the S&P 500 26% return and hugely ahead of the equal weight at 14%. And this gap was even wider before the last two months of the year when you had a big rally in the equal weight and small cap indices. Uh, at one point, small caps were down and you had all of these companies up huge. The spread was enormous but some of that gap was closed uh, near the end of the year. So what we actually saw during 2023 was a return to what we saw in 2021. And that's what with the biggest companies getting bigger. And this is just an illustration here, Magnificent Seven weights entering 2023, their total combined weights were at 20%. They end the year at 28%. And it's hard to imagine, but if we look at the Magnificent Seven and their combined weighting in the MSCI World Index, it's actually higher than the combined weighting of the all of the stocks in the UK, China, France, and Japan combined. So just stunning, stunning 
market capitalizations from these seven companies in the US. And the question for investors, we know what it is. The question is, are investors paying too high of a price? If you look at the average price to earnings ratio, forward PE ratio for the Magnificent Seven, you're looking at over 30 times earnings, significantly higher than the remaining 493 companies in the S&P 500. And the question is, are expectations too high for these companies? That's a question that will be answered in part in 2024. Now, in terms of other things that were difficult for the market, there was a very brief period where there was a little back and forth in terms of the market and some concerns about this so-called debt ceiling. And uh, there was a lot of headlines, a lot of people saying this is a crisis, uh, but all, all the rest of it. What I said at the time, and I'll say it again today, is there's no such thing as a debt ceiling when you're spending trillions dollars more, spending trillions of more dollars than you're taking in, which is what the U.S. government is doing. So uh, this concept, there was a debt ceiling at 31.4 trillion. It was always going to be lifted, and that's exactly what happened. It was suspended. You had a very brief uh, period where you had sovereign CDS spreads blowing out. People were saying the U.S. is going to default. And you had actually uh, treasury yields rising because of this prospect. All of that was nonsense. The U.S. is not going to default. You can't default on your debt when you can print money and pay off the uh, people that you owe money to, which is what the U.S. could do if they needed to. And very quickly, debt ceiling uh, is suspended and this CDS spread comes right back down. And what do we see with the national debt? after that point, after the debt ceiling is lifted, well, just an absolute explosion. We saw a two and a half trillion dollar increase in the national debt in the last seven months of the year. We actually crossed above 34 trillion uh, for the first time. So we went from 31.4 trillion to 34 trillion from June to the end of the year. So three more trillion dollar milestones were hit in 2023. Uh, just an unbelievable increase in the national debt. And the big issue, as we say, is not the debt per se, but the ability to pay that debt back. And that became more difficult in 2023 because the interest expenses that we're paying are going in one direction and that direction is up. So over the past year, this is data through November, $949 billion in terms of interest payments on public debt. I suspect at some point, early 2024, this is going to surpass $1 trillion. And unless interest rates go down in a rapid fashion, uh, this is going to be continue to be an issue. And at some point, if it continues at the current pace, this is going to outpace uh, Social Security in terms of being the single largest item in the budget. So national debt, one thing you could be sure in 2024, National debt will be higher until people start focusing on it and say, we can't spend money on everything that we want to. We can't run these massive deficits, particularly when the economy is in expansion until we have really concern from citizens to say this, we don't want to wait until this becomes a crisis. We need to start addressing it now until we get to that point. Unfortunately, this is going to continue to go up and up and up. We're going to see 35 trillion, of course, at some point in 2024 probably another trillion after that. So biggest story in terms of surprises for markets in 2023 was the recession that never came. Again, going back to that survey, 85% of people that I pulled on Twitter were expecting that. If you look at economists, number was probably that high or even higher. What do we actually have? We had the expansion continue. GDP growth, positive Q1, positive Q2, and in Q3, we actually saw it jump to 4.9%, big number, much higher than people were expecting. And for the fourth quarter, we don't have data yet, but the expectation is it's going to be positive as well. So recession never came, huge upside surprise, of course, because people were positioned for a recession. They're expecting a recession. They're expecting earnings, of course, to be impacted by that and to go down. And so when that didn't happen, well, that's just a huge transition that market participants 
would make from the bearish side to the bullish side, as we'll show in a bit. So where is the economic expansion at right now? 41 months in duration, cumulative GDP growth since April 2020, 18%, annualizing at 5%. So far, obviously, that's going to come down. There was a big boost coming out of the COVID recession. And what's driving economic activity? What's helping this expansion continue? Number one would be U.S. job market, U.S. employment, which just continues to increase. 36 six consecutive months now of job growth in the U.S., so great to see that. And the unemployment rate, talk about unexpected. Not only did we not have a recession in 2023, but we actually saw the lowest U.S. unemployment rate since 1969 at 3.4%, and we end the year at 3.7%. So much, much better than anyone was anticipating in terms of the U.S. unemployment rate. If you look at the Fed's projections entered in the year, they were expecting the unemployment rate to rise much higher than this. If we actually look at the number of months now that we've been below 4%, this is very unusual to be this low for this long. Not unprecedented, but very unusual. We haven't seen it a streak this long, 23 months since the late 1960s. So great news on the jobs front. And where are people spending money? Well, number one would be travel, leisure, entertainment. That would be the big areas in 2023. And what we saw, great news here, was the airline travel, the number of U.S. passengers on airlines hit a record high, finally recovering from that COVID decline and surpassing the peak levels that we saw in 2019. So recession, no recession uh, being the big surprise. Well, number two for markets would have to be the earnings comeback, just unbelievable comeback from fourth quarter of 2022. What we saw after that was earnings come right back to being positive on a year over year basis for the remaining three quarters that we have data for. S&P 500 earnings were up year over year in all three of those. And if we look at S&P 500 operating earnings, trailing 12 month, almost back to record highs. And the expectation is that if we, when fourth quarter data comes in, this is going to hit uh, new highs for S&P 500 operating earnings. So what we actually saw was not an earnings or continued earnings recession, but a rapid earnings recovery. Companies got leaner in 2022. Their top line continued to grow in 2023. Profit margins actually expanded in 2023 and earnings recovered. So they adapted very well to that period of high inflation. And incredibly, what we saw in 2023, really no one was predicting this, was that we actually saw a multiple expansion for the S&P 500, 19 and a half times earnings entering 2023. It left 2023 at 22.3 times earnings. So actually expanding 14% because the gain in the S&P 500 outpaced earnings growth for the year. So what's the average S&P 500 multiple? Going back to 1989, it's around 19 uh, times earnings. We're at 22 times today. So actually ending 2023 with enough optimism where the S&P 500's earnings are actually above the historical average. So for me, in terms of the macro picture, Biggest surprise in 2023 was definitely what happened in the housing market. We had mortgage rates in the U.S. hit their highest level since November 2000, 7.79%. We had affordability in terms of what percentage of your income you would need to buy the median home that was for sale hit record lows. So you need 44.6% of your income to buy the average home. Obviously, that's way too high. That's not sustainable. That's going to lead to a crash in demand. That part I got correct. We saw a huge decline in demand, a huge decline in activity. We had existing home sales at their lowest levels since the financial crisis. But what I didn't anticipate was that as much as demand would come down, supply came down even more. So we had the lowest levels of existing homes for sale for the month of September. You got to go back to the 1990s to find a lower level of existing homes for sale. And what was the reason for this is you had existing homeowners who had low mortgage rates. So most people have mortgage rates 3%, 4% because they either bought houses in 2018, 19, 20, or they refinanced 
went mortgage rates went down. So very few people have mortgage rates 6%, 7%, or close to 8%, which we hit at one point in 2023. Very few people have these high mortgage rates, and they want to keep those low mortgage rates so they didn't put their homes up for sale. And many of them didn't do it for one of two reasons. Number one would be they can't afford to buy a new home if they had to take out a, a mortgage at the current rates. And the other one is simply, well, now they locked in that low mortgage rate. Well, why should they? Even if they could afford to buy a home at a higher mortgage rate, they're saving all of this money by staying put. And so that was really an unexpected surprise to me is that how low inventories uh, went to the point where prices, not only did they not go down home prices in 2023, they actually went up. So even though we have the lowest levels of housing affordability in history, if you look at the Case-Shiller National Index here, actually hit record highs in 2023. And this is something that's actually absolutely completely shocking. And the big question is, is this supply demand imbalance going to come back? And, and how does it come back? Does it require mortgage rates to go down for people to start listing their houses again? So it kind of flips everything that you thought you knew about the housing market on its head, where previously people said, well, if mortgage rates were to go up this much in a short period of time, surely home prices would have to go down. Well, it does come back to supply and demand, and it will only go down if you have that supply number move up. So it's kind of strange, but perhaps if mortgage rates go lower, we can actually see home prices come down or at least stabilize. The uh, question I think for 2024 will be this affordability level. Is it going to snap back or is it gonna take a long time? And maybe perhaps just it's going to take years where incomes just have to continue to increase and perhaps we have sideways home prices instead of what we saw during the last housing bubble where prices came down and that's how affordability increased. So I don't know what will happen in, in 2024, but I know that this year has taught us a lot in terms of the housing market. Don't assume anything. Don't assume just because something is happening like rising mortgage rates that the uh, home prices have to go down. The market doesn't have to do anything ultimately comes back to supply and demand at the end of the day. So huge one here for me. This is a chart that I'll show in a little bit here, which I think is the most important chart for an economy. But this is the big story in terms of what is actually allowing people to get excited. So we have that AI exuberance. That's great. But the inflation concern coming into 2023 was valid. And if we didn't kick inflation, if inflation didn't come down, I don't think you have the types of returns that we saw in 2023. And if we look at CPI here, this really tells the story. CPI coming down to 3.1%. Um, the last reading we got was in November. Of course, CPI dipping back below 4%. Big change from the peak in middle of 2022. Look at the components here. Almost everything is better than it was at the peak in June 2022. We have outright declines. A lot of the energy areas, look at fuel oil, gas utilities, gasoline are actually down since then. Used cars down as well. Very important food at home, so at the grocery store. Finally, inflation there is coming down less than 2%. And shelter being the huge one here, and I've talked about this a number of times this year, that's still elevated at 6.5%, but that's a lagging indicator. And what we saw in 2023 was actually rents go down, asking rents. So likely, with a lag, we're going to see this number come down sharply in 2024. Hopefully, that will be the case. And if we look at consumer prices, excluding that shelter, we're already below 2%. So hugely unexpected in terms of market participants. They're expecting maybe inflation to come down but definitely not this much and definitely not on a global basis. So almost every single country has a lower inflation rate today than they did a year ago, Argentina being the notable exception here. But of course, they had an election where they elected Javier Mille in part because of that to attack this higher inflation rate, a big surprise there. But if we look at the US here, 4% lower CPI. If we look at the uh, UK and the Eurozone, much bigger declines in their inflation rates than people were expecting. And that really increased sentiment. It really helped 
people become more confident that perhaps inflation, even if it's not kicked, well, maybe we're not going to see inflation go up into the double digits like many were fearing a return to 1970s was where this drags on uh, for a long time. So no one can predict that. Hopefully it doesn't come back again, but where it is today, we know for sure is much better than people were expecting. This is the most important chart to me. This is something we were hoping entering the year would get back into positive territory. This is the main reason why the Fed chose to hike, in my view, four times, even though we had those banking issues. It was to try to get wages above in, uh, above the level of inflation, and that's what's happened now for seven consecutive months. The increases in hourly earnings, which are running above 4%, have been above the rate of inflation. So and to end the year, we have 4% earnings growth. We have 3.1% inflation. That positive spread compounded over time is what leads to prosperity for a nation. So we absolutely want to see this continue. It should continue at least for a few more months, but hopefully it continues throughout 2024. And this is why you have to tackle inflation. A lot of people said, well, why not just let inflation run? And you know, people, as long as people's earnings go up, well, it's hard for earnings to keep up with high single digit, double digit inflation. Just ask anyone in Argentina how difficult it is to re maintain your purchasing power. So with inflation back down to 3% and earnings going up more than that, that's a huge win for the markets, they put a lot of money in the pockets of consumers and big reason why the economy did as well as it did in 2023. So we have to talk about the last two months of 2023. It was really a rally for the ages. We had a pretty sizable correction in September and October, 10% in the S&P. Bonds were really beaten down. You had the 10-year treasury bond actually move above 5% briefly near the end of October. And bonds were really in the tank. Sentiment was very bad for the bond market. And then all of a sudden, the market flipped. Bond yields started going down. Stocks started going up. You had the S&P 500 in November and December have its best two-month return that we've seen in a while, one of the best we've seen in history, up 13.9%. It was the 12th best we've seen historical, historically. And what we're talking about here is something that we often see coming out of bear markets. So if we look at March, April 2009, uh, after that bear market, April, May 2020, we look at early uh, in uh, end of 1982. We look at early 1975. These are after historic bear markets, these huge rallies. So the hope, the optimism is, well, this is going to kick off now a multi-year bull market. And indeed, if we look at the one-year returns or even three-year returns, you can see on average, the market does tend to be up over the next year, over the next few years following these big two-month gains. And so hopefully that's the case again. That certainly doesn't seem to be bearish that the market is this much, but up this much. But I would certainly temper your expectations. This is not normal. This is the 99th percentile type of gain for a two month period. So don't expect that for January, February 2024. Temper your expectations for sure. But what a two months for the stock market and the bond market, even better relative to its history here. It's the best two months for the US bond market since September, October, 1982, 8.5% gain for the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index. So just when everyone was giving up on bonds, and I was saying at the time, this is the worst time to give up on bonds. You actually have some yield. There's 5% yield. Who knows what's going to happen in the short run, but um, in the long run, you're, you should get around 5% return on, now on your bonds. And, and we have an 8.5% gain, which... Uh, pulls forward years worth of bond returns. And now people are excited about bonds. Again, that's not how you want to be doing it. You want to be doing it in the opposite uh, opposite fashion. But what's fascinating in terms of bond yields uh, for 2023 is the 10-year actually ended the year 388, the same level as where it entered the year. So nothing happened in terms of the 10-year yield, but you had these huge swings along the way. Of course, it went as high as 5% and then came back down at the end of the year. But if we look at the entire yield curve here, what we saw was short end because of the Fed hikes continued to go up. So 
best yields on cash that we've seen I have to go all the way back to 2007 in terms of cash yields. Uh, and, and really at year end, we haven't seen a cash yield this high since 2000. So big story in 2023 was money pouring into money market funds, uh, just record highs in terms of, of money market inflows. And what we said uh, a few months ago was be careful about thinking about uh, money market funds because uh, that is not a permanent yield. If As soon as the Fed starts cutting rates, that yield is going to come down and come down in a hurry. So start thinking about longer term bonds. And when we've seen that, the market's kind of front run that expectation. Who knows if the Fed is going to cut rates as many times as the market is expecting. But that yield, the big, bigger point is it's not permanent. So enjoy these cash yields definitely while you can. What everyone's thinking about is where is that money going to go? A lot of it, it went into money market funds in 2023. Where's it going to go in 2024? And the ironic thing is that if we look at the bond market by the year end, a lot of people hiding in, in cash, but you actually had sensitive credit, sensitive areas doing the best in terms of the bond market, high yield leverage loans up double digits. You had, because of that enormous rally in, in November, December, you had investment grade bonds up pretty good 9%. And even the aggregate bond uh, ETF actually outpaced what you would earn on cash. So it took an incredible rally at year end. But if we look at the picture for bonds in 2023, really the opposite of 2022, which was the worst year in history. And you often see that in markets, right? Worst year in history creates opportunity. And the opportunity uh, is, is seen now in these returns for 2023. And Last point on the bond market here, high yield credit spreads. Talk about a change in sentiment here. Tightest credit spreads. This is a spread between junk bond yields and yields on uh, treasury bonds of a similar duration. So 3.32% spread, tightest we've seen since April 2022. So right now, entering 2024, very little fear in terms of the credit markets, in terms of defaults. And... Uh, if, if investors start expecting a recession, you expect it to move in the opposite direction. If they think that recession's off the table, expansion's gonna continue, spreads could tighten even further, but very different sentiment in terms of high yield bonds today versus a year ago. So big story in markets this year was the fact that 2023 was really the polar opposite of 2022 in almost every way you can think of. Number one here, looking at value and growth. So 2022, we finally saw value beat growth by a sizable margin, 20, over 21% outperformance in value over growth in 2022. 2023, not, not only the, does uh, value give up that, that gain, but even more, 31% outperformance of growth over value. So going right back to the prior regime where growth has been outperforming value, for well over a decade. So 2023, the 31% outperformance was the second biggest uh, spread in terms of growth outperforming value that we've ever seen. Number one was in 2020 when growth outperformed value by 35.7%. And looking at other big trends here, S&P versus equal weight. So looking at large versus the average stock in the S&P 500, huge spread here. This was even bigger before the last few months of the year, but we had a comeback in small and equal weight stocks. 12.4% spread though, still biggest since 1998. And again, reversal from 2022 when we saw the average stock outperform the cap weighted index. And if we look at concentration here in the top 10 holdings, we talked about the Magnificent Seven, but during 2023, this came right back in 2022, we saw the concentration go down because the biggest stocks underperformed, while well, biggest stocks in 2023 outperformed up 30.5%, uh, not up 34.5%, but 30.5% concentration, biggest concentration that we've seen for the top 10 stocks in the S&P 500 in history with data going back to 1980. So the big got bigger in 2023, which is the opposite of 2022. And then US versus international, this was something in 2022, said maybe it's going back in the opposite direction finally, because international outperformed US, 2023 right back to US outperformance. 
7.7%. And we noted this many times, but over the past decade, it's not even close. The U.S. has outperformed international stocks by an enormous margin. But 2023 S&P 500 back into the leaderboard here. Surprising here, top three country ETFs for 2023. I don't think anyone had this on their list going into the year. Argentina, number one, number two, Poland, number three, Greece. So it just shows you how unpredictable the markets can be. But S&P 500, U.S. stocks back outperforming like they have been for most of the last decade plus. Let's end with the story about the triumph of the optimists. And that's really what 2023 was. If you were negative coming into 2023, if you were pessimistic, you were in the majority. There were very few people saying, this is going to be a great year. If we look at the Wall Street strategist and their projections for the S&P 500, they do this every at the end of each year, predicting where the S&P 500 is going to end the year. Nobody thought it would end the year this high. The actual S&P 500 end, end of year value, 4,770, was above every single Wall Street target. It was 18% above the average of these targets. So much better year than anyone expected. You had the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ 100 ETF on a total return basis in December, hit an all-time high together. You haven't seen that since 2021. So a complete recovery if we look at total returns, including dividends from the 2022 bear market. 26% total return for the S&P 500. So snapping right back from that 18% decline. Was there trouble along the way? For sure. Every year has a drawdown. We saw about two separate corrections of 10% for the S&P 500, but that did not prevent the index from being up 26%. And we see this time and time again. Big drawdown doesn't prevent a higher return for the market at year end. And the reason why you're getting a 10% return for the S&P 500 over the long run is because there's risk, because there's always a drawdown along the way. Bond market. 13% decline for the Bloomberg aggregate 2022 was the, by far the worst year ever for the bond market. Snaps back with a 5.5% return in 2023. If you look at a 60-40 portfolio, a lot of people said the portfolio is dead entering 2023 because it had a huge decline in 2022. Snaps back with an 18% return. Look at sectors here. Technology leading all S&P 500 sectors, 56% return. That's the highest return for the technology sector since 1999. And I know what you're thinking. Oh man, 1999, are we going to have 2000, 2001, 2002 uh, bear market again? Hopefully not, <laughs> but just incredible after 2022 that we snap back with one of the best years in history for the tech sector. And every year the leadership changes. Remember 2022, Energy stocks were the only ones doing very well, up 64%. Well, they actually finished 2023 down 1%. Just shows you no one can predict what sector is going to be outperforming in any given year, why you need to be diversified. And if we look at this chart of asset class returns, this is absolutely a triumph of the optimist. Every single major asset class was up in 2023. Bitcoin leading the way. NASDAQ 100, number two, growth stocks, large caps, small caps, U.S. international, high yield bonds, investment grade bonds, preferred stocks, emerging markets, bonds, cash, everything except for commodities higher in 2023. And commodities being lower was actually a positive, was actually a good thing because it meant lower inflation and lower inflation than people were expecting. So even that one negative wasn't a true negative because most people don't own this commodity ETF or, or commodities in general. Uh, so very much almost a perfect year for the markets as a whole. And we end the year in terms of volatility at the lowest levels we've seen since 2019. So if we remember highest close in history during COVID, come all the way back down, we got the VIX at 12, lowest close since 2019. And we have sentiment, which was so negative enter, entering the year. We had that huge wall of worry. Well, that war, wall of worry has been torn down. 32% more bears than bulls in December 20, 2000, 2022. So coming into 2023, 32% more bears than bulls. And today, 
32% more bulls than bears. So a complete opposite. Everybody optimistic. Why are they optimistic? Well, because prices are higher, 25% higher to be exact. Those are the charts and themes that told the story of 2023. What happens next? What's going to happen in 2024? I'm sure that's the question that you're asking. The answer is, we don't know. It's an empty book right now because the story has yet to be written. As prices change in 2024, the narratives are going to change with it. What is everyone asking me today? The same questions I get each and every year at the beginning of the year. Where will the S&P 500 end the year? How about the 10-year treasury yield? Where is crude oil headed? Is gold or Bitcoin a better investment? How many times will the Fed cut rates this year? Is inflation going to continue to move lower? Or is it going to go higher? And when will the U.S. economy fall into an official recession? I don't have the answers to any of these questions. Can't predict the future. As Lao Tzu once said, those who have knowledge don't predict. Those who do predict don't have knowledge. And there is an alternative. And the alternative to playing that prediction game is to simply weigh the evidence as it comes, invest based on probabilities, never certainty, be humble, be thankful, and try your best to find the right portfolio, the right plan for you. Everyone has a different path as an investor because everyone's different. And you want to find that portfolio and plan that you can stick with long enough to reap the enormous benefits of long-term compounding. So for 2024, I have the same prediction that I had for 2023, and it's that you will see many more surprises ahead. That is the nature of markets. Thanks so much for joining me today. Happy New Year, everyone. I wish you all the best in 2024. A lot of new content coming out this year, so make sure you subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time for the regular Week in Charts. Thanks. Mm -hmm.